live. Welcome, everyone. If you're thinking, wow, Phil, your room has changed, you're right. I am not at home. I'm currently in Reno, Nevada. I'm staying at the Silver Legacy Hotel. Um, I'm here a, a day or two before um, a Stillwater School I'm doing with the good folks at Pyramid Fly Company. But I just want to welcome everyone, both on my uh, Facebook uh, channel and my YouTube channel, to another, uh, my first Lake Talk Live event of the season. And it, it just makes sense to have uh, my good fishing buddy and friend, um, Brian Chan, joining me tonight. And what we're going to do is really understand how important it is to understand how lakes work, particularly at this time of the season, as the lakes come out of uh, their winter thaw and winter freeze rather and start thawing and uh, where the trout are going to be and why. Uh, because knowing this kind of information makes sure you pick you put yourself in the right place, because if you fish lakes at all, you know that. Um, there's a lot of water out there, so anything you can do to eliminate that water and uh, make the right decisions and put yourself in the right place to catch fish is a good thing. And we encourage you to ask any questions you have. Um, we will put them up onto the, uh, the screen. Um, either we'll trickle them in when, um, if they're appropriate, but we'll probably handle most of them at the back end so we can keep everything flowing. Um, if you can't stick around for the whole presentation, we're only going to be about an hour or so. Uh, if that tonight, that's what we're planning. But if you can't stick around, don't worry. It is being recorded and will be available soon after we shut down on both my Phil Rowley Fly Fishing uh, Facebook page and my YouTube channel. And pretty good chance it will be shared on other uh, channels as well and other Facebook pages. So once again, really excited to have uh, you know, a fellow Stillwater addict, good friend, retired fisheries biologist, author, fly designer, business partner. Brian and I run the Stillwater Fly Fishing Store together, TV host with Sports Fishing on the Fly. Brian Chan. So I'm just going to bring Brian in and uh, hello, Brian. Thanks for joining me. Greetings from Reno. Greetings it's a little warmer down there than it is here today. Uh, yeah, but this weekend we're supposed to get lots of snow, but that's when Pyramid Lake, home to these giant cutthroat trout, can really get fired up. So if you can tolerate yeah. the well, cold, hopefully I've got some good grip and grin shots uh, coming, or at least some good release shots. So We're in so, the middle of a bit of a snow snowfall tonight in Kamloops, but it's been a pretty mild winter. Yeah, it's probably a good way because, you know, last year, especially in British Columbia, it was such a, you know, such an unusual spring with a lots of winter kill, wasn't it? Yeah, we, it was, uh, last winter wasn't, uh, wasn't very kind to at least the uh, southern interior region and, and, and then into the caribou regions of BC, but uh at least we had a lot of we had a lot more snow. So this winter we're looking at a pretty low snowpack, and uh, you know the lakes were low when they froze over. Uh, the good thing is that the oxygen levels overall are better than they were on many lakes that were marginal last winter. So uh, the chances of winter kill are going to be a lot less this. Uh, uh, this spring. So uh, keeping our fingers crossed, uh, we get through this winter and uh, we're definitely going to be fishing earlier than we did last year. <laughs> yeah, I think we will too. I'm talking back home with my wife. Uh, we got a little bit of snow over the last few days, but we've had some, you know, we had some bitterly, a bitterly cold week where we were down to, to minus 50 something with the, uh, with the uh, wind chill. And I remember looking at that in Fahrenheit for my American friends. And that's where Fahrenheit actually gets colder than centigrade when it gets that low. So that was uh, our new puppy going outside for a pee was a world record event. Um, but then we would have a week where it was, you know, 9, 12 uh, Celsius. So, you know, 40, 50 degrees at least. So yeah. it's just been up and down. And we're, they're talking again, particularly in the southern part of the province, really low water levels and fires again, because everything is brittle and dry. So, um, yeah. So, so maybe we'll start by, um, let's talk about, Brian, what's going on right now, the, the lakes that are on, what's gone on through winter? And I'll, uh, let, I'll let you leave that and I'll bring up an, an animation for people to uh, to watch as we go through this. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're getting towards late season uh, winter conditions on the lake. So auction levels are 
are, are substantially lower now than they were when the lake first froze over. And as the winter continues, the fish are going to be pushed higher and higher in the water column, still under the ice, but the majority of oxygen available to them will be in the top two to three, maybe four meters of uh, water. So they're they're pushed up higher and higher, and uh, hopefully uh, they'll they'll make it uh, to ice off, and uh, and and they'll they'll be uh, alive. And uh, it looks like they're, the majority of lakes are going to make it this winter, thankfully. Um, but it's it's a little touch and go. This is kind of a tricky time of year. In one sense, we want to get winter over with and get those ice peeled off early. But in another sense, we, we need more snow, and that means it's got to, got to stay cold. So it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off situation right now. Hopefully, uh, we are going to get a bit more snow. But uh, I, on the other hand, it would be nice if, they, if, the, if the lakes did come off uh, a bit earlier. There's certainly a far less ice on the lakes this winter right now. So this day, so the same day last year, there was 17 inches of ice on Stump Lake. Uh, between Merritt and Kamloops, and uh, yesterday there's maybe six inches. Wow. It's good ice, yeah. but that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge difference. So, yeah. Brian, maybe we, with the graphic here, we can run through again for those people that aren't familiar with what goes on under the ice um, on those lakes that ice over the whole stratification and, and what winter kill actually is, um, because some people may not be familiar with it and why it's, you know, it, Again, the impact of last year really brought it home to everyone. Yeah, so when you look at this diagram here, if it was just when the lake freezes over, uh, typically there's oxygen uh, throughout the entire water column, top to bottom, even in the deeper depths. So the fish can uh, be found anywhere throughout the water column. But you have to remember when that lake freezes over and then you get snow on the ice, there's a lot, all that green plant and, aquatic green plant growth begins to decompose. It dies off because it can no longer photosynthesize. And that decomposition process strips oxygen out of the water. And it works, it, so the oxygen levels decrease from the deepest part of the lake, slowly pushing up through the water column as, it, as winter progresses. So by this time of the year, the fish are often confined to the upper layers of water, you know, one to four meters in depth. And that's where the most or the most uh, available amount of oxygen is still there. And, th and that's the way it'll be right until uh, ice off. So the day the ice comes off the lake, uh, the fish will still be confined in that narrow band of oxygenated water. They will not be scattered throughout the entire water column simply because there's not enough oxygen and this would this would apply to 95 percent of the small lakes that we like to fish mm -hmm. there's always exceptions to like much bigger lakes like sheridan lake or white lake uh, uh out, out towards salmon arm um you know that th they're usually have more oxygen uh throughout uh their water columns that are much bigger water bodies but in the typical small lakes in the merritt Kamloops, williams lake 100 mile house area yeah, the fish are, fish are combined into the upper layers of water. Even that's the day the ice comes off, uh, we need we need those fish need to wait for turnover to occur. So spring turnover occurs usually 10 to 14 days after ice off. Uh, and it's a phenomenon that uh, requires heat to warm the water up and, and then a, in combination with a wind event. So water, when the day the ice comes off a lake, the water is cooler in the upper layers and warmer at the bottom. And it's warmer at the bottom because all this plant life that decomposes gives off heat as a byproduct. So the bottom layers or deeper layers are warmer than the upper layers. So lakes don't like to mix. Water doesn't like to mix until the water is a similar temperature from top to bottom, which we call isothermal. And uh, water likes to mix, or it's most dense when the, when the water is 
four degrees centigrade or 39 degrees Fahrenheit from top to bottom. When that happens and you get a strong wind, then the surface waters will sink, get pushed down to the bottom, and the bottom waters will come up to the surface. And that mixing action initially reduces the amount of oxygen in the entire water column uh, because remember we when we came off uh, when the ice came off there was a narrow band of oxygenated water and then anoxic water below so that mixing distributes what oxygenated water there was throughout the water column so there's a bit of a hit in, when the when the lake turns over the fish aren't happy they definitely go off the bite but it's an important ecological process that now circulates the water and recharges it with oxygen from top to bottom and that's what sets it up the lakes gets set up for the spring season and all those hatches that we look forward to now last year we, we touched on it so much winter kill and and that was partly due because um we had that just really unusual um fall didn't we um it never really it didn't cool down the lakes didn't have a chance to cool down naturally and they went into a winter state rather abruptly and never had a chance to mix did they so yep. they were, they the were, were so, it was so warm two falls ago that uh the lakes what happened the lakes didn't cool down enough to complete fall turnover mm -hmm. which is a similar situation as spring turnover and fall turnover recharges the entire water column with oxygen so a lot of lakes went into winter uh without turning over because we had a sudden cold snap in early november and up until then, it was really warm. So the lakes didn't cool down enough. Water didn't get isothermal to allow mixing to occur. And the lakes froze over without sufficient oxygen to get them through the winter in, in the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. And we also have a we also have spring kill too, right? So that's a, a, you know, winter kill occurs when the ice is still on the lake. And then you can have a kill in, with a lake that's in really low oxygen uh, poor oxygen state and it kills during the mixing process yep. doesn't it? yeah so that that spring turnover remember it's distributing that minimum amount of oxygen throughout the entire water column and if it's not enough uh the fish will die and that, yeah. that that's what we call a spring kill so what happens the fish made it through the winter in that narrow band of oxygen water the ice comes off 10 days later it mixes and turns over it's insufficient oxygen so they Die. Yeah. There's a question here on insects, Brian, about uh, obviously winter kill. The, f the fish pay the, the, they're the first to pay the price because they consume the most oxygen. But it, there was pretty severe kills last year where even, you yeah. know, eggs were. In, in a, so most winters, those uh, insects re require such minute amounts of oxygen compared to vertebrates yeah. uh, um, like fish. But uh, it, uh, it's often a combination of low, extremely low oxygen, and then uh, there's methane and hydrogen sulfide gas that are byproducts of anaerobic decomposition. And the three of those uh, components uh, collectively can induce kills to, uh, well, we, we see shrimp, uh, you know, scuds getting hit. Um, you see dragonflies, and the leeches are pretty resilient. Um, bait flies are a little sensitive, uh, and obviously chronomids survive because they're still in the larval stage, uh, and they have that ability to live in almost oxygen, uh, yeah, uh, minimally oxygenated water, and hence the bloodworm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, because I remember you used to tell me when you were, you know, back in your fisheries biologist days, if because you would often do. Uh, oxygen samples at this time of the year because that's generally when the lake's in the lowest state. And if scuds came billowing out of the hole you drug, that was not usually a good sign because they were all gathered up near the surface trying to get what available oxygen was left. Yeah, 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 so, yeah absolutely. So Jason's got a question here. What happens if it warms up too quickly? Does this affect the hatches later on? So everything in lakes is driven by water temperature. So if we get an early spring and then a hot, hot session, hot spring months, then yes, you'll you'll get a, you you potentially can get uh, 
earlier condiment hatches, which will then mean earlier mayfly hatches, and then it'll carry on down the line. But, yeah. uh, you know, overall, you know, we might get a, you know, you get a really warm spell and then it cools down. So it kind of, Mother Nature has a way of trying to keep the train on the tracks <laughs> and on schedule. But yeah, an, an, an unseasonably warm spring right after ice off can, can stimulate uh, rapid development of uh, chronomid during the pupation stage and you'll get chronomid hatches hatching much sooner than normal. Yeah, it kind of advances everything, doesn't it, right? So, yeah. 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 So, so there's a question here of somebody up in your neck, up in the Kamloops area. Um, well, that wasn't the question. I'll come back to that later. Sorry about that. Um, popped up. Um, just concerned about the low water levels. Like Shushwap looks apparently really low. Yeah, I know where. Yeah, I saw a picture of of the salmon arm foreshore. Oh my gosh, it looks like a minus tide, and you could be out digging clams. It was so <laughs> low. It was really low. So we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of lakes went into winter low, mm -hmm. low water levels. So the problem is because we're not, we don't have a really good snowpack, we're not going to fill these lakes with runoff from snow melt. So that means we're going to, we're going to have lower water to start the year off. You have to consider evaporation coming off the lake naturally. You have to consider if the lake is an irrigation impoundment, water's still going to get pulled off. And if it's a hot summer, um, it just exasperates the situation where we've got really low water levels, which could potentially make the, the littoral zone, the, the shallow water zone, not as hospitable to, to trout survival, uh, you know, all summer long. And they may get kicked off there because the water's simply too warm and not uh, carrying sufficient oxygen for them to stay on there and feed all day long. They may only be able to get them on, get onto those shoals in the, in the nighttime during those hot summer months. So, yeah, we're, we're not, it's good because it's not a perfect situation because with low water, going into spring with low water and we have a hot summer, it sets us up for summer kill. Yeah, yeah. So that's, and like I say, in my province, it's no different. And I've heard talking to uh, friends and colleagues yeah. down in the States yeah. too, that they're facing similar situations in the West. So, so anyway, so let's, <laughs> we're still going to get to go out there. Let, let's talk about some of the tactics then. So right after ice off, 10 days, the lake's still stratified. It hasn't mixed. You know, what's the plan? Where are we going and why? You know, those first first few days, first week after ice off, prior to any turnover, you know the fish are going to be in shallow water. Mm -hmm. And there is no no substitute for taking the time once you get on the lake just to putt around and look for moving fish in shallow water. You mm -hmm. see one, see two, see three, you're gone. Yeah. And they're, they're typically going to be, they'll be in groups, concentrated in small groups. They won't be scattered everywhere. They'll be localized. And then you can find a group of fish and work over them. And then they might, you might spook them out of there because you might only be fishing five feet of water, might, might be fishing three and a half feet of water. And so you've got to be prepared to move to look for other groups of fish. So you tend to have to move around a lot in that early ice off, uh, right after ice off, and and be prepared to stay the the day mm -hmm. because it could be a morning bite or they might they might not get active to mid to late afternoon if it's a sunny day and that little bit of warmth it gets their metabolism going a bit more and they become active late in the afternoon so. Yeah, um, you, you have to pick your poison go, you know, if you're going to go, basically, I say, if you're going to only go for part of a day, try to go for the afternoon to to early evening period, uh, especially if it's a nice sunny day. Yeah, and I, I, the, the water temperature is so important in that use of your thermometer. I remember you and I years ago were on Roche Lake and we were running around, you know, doing what you said, looking for moving fish. They're concentrated, usually pretty showy and we went to one bay and had a pretty good morning and then decided we'd see if we could find some other and 
you know, the temperature difference was barely a, a you know a degree of Fahrenheit, and there was no fish and to be found. We had to we went back up into that North Bay that generally gets the sun first, muddy bottom that warms up, and, and had some really good really good uh, um, fishing. So that those north ends can be good because just the way the, the light and the, the way the atmosphere is tilting and all that yeah. sciencey stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, so they're a good thing. And of course, you know, at that time of the year, what, you know, flies were micro leeches, blobs, good old black and red chronomid. They love, they'll eat chronomids even if they're not really yeah, active. You know, they, you can try them because there's all, in a lot of situations, there'll be, you'll, you'll see some chronomids coming off really, really early, you know, within a day or two of ice off. But small attractor patterns like Prince nymphs are very effective because it's something they can chase. It looks like a water boatman because there's going to be water boatmen that have overwintered, back swimmers overwintered. So they're always a good little, little uh, fly to have on, uh, whether you're fishing the very, very skinny shallow water or even the edges of the drop off. If you see fish moving, you know, they'll chase. Mm -hmm. Fish are, are, they've had a long winter, they're hungry and, uh, yeah, like a uh, prince nymph is always one of my go-to patterns that I saw. Yeah, that's a good fly. If you go to Argentina too, that's a good fly. Bring those <laughs> along there too. Yeah, I, it's funny. I had a uh, I had a friend who used to fish a lot of ice off in uh, the Sierras in California, and black patterns were one of his favorite um, because you know a lot of he felt that a lot of the dark insects they they would get moving a little quicker because they would absorb the sun's energy a little more efficiently than a light-bodied insect. And would be more active, so fish would see them. So it seems plausible. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and you also the other thing too, we both run into is you'll often get those really warm days, you know, unseasonably warm, and you'll get boatmen and back swimmers going too, um, which is something people normally associate with spring, uh, fall rather. But you know, you can have some pretty good. I've had some pretty good back swimmer and boatmen. Absolutely. And, and they're going to tell you they're active because they're going to they're going to fly. Yeah. They're gonna be flying around and popping back in the water. Yeah, so you just, yeah, you know, you got to be prepared to fish, you know, leeches, attractive patterns like vampire leeches, a deadly leech uh, in, a, in the, right, at, well, it's all the, all the time, but at ice off and then, you know, uh, black peacock uh, dubbing uh, type leech bodies. That, yeah. that they were good. Maroon is always a good pattern. So, yeah. but you got to, got to cover some water um, and, and look for fish. This is a good question for you and I, and especially you as you're, you're in therapy for your blob, blob addiction, but uh, <laughs> can you fish blobs in early spring? He's, his, J Jason's friend's trying to make him a, a blob convert, and, yeah. and Jason, you should just relent and convert. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, Jason, you definitely need some blobs in your fly boxes. Uh, uh, that's plural blobs of <laughs> different yeah. different color combinations. They're they're good right from the get go. Um, yeah. you, know, you know the zooplankton are readily available all winter long, and uh, they'll 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 the trout will eat them right the day the ice comes off. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah, in my waters, I'm allowed to fish multiple flies. Every time we get together, I like to tease you about that, Brian. And uh, um, you know, a, a micro leech with a blob above it is a, a pretty deadly combination um it'd be a deadly you know, combination and and that blob and you know for those of you who are out there who are allowed to fish multiple flies that blob is such not only does it suggest zooplankton but it's also you know it's big it's bright it attracts fish in they'll come in to investigate that blob and, and maybe they don't eat it but then they look down or look around and see those other flies in the neighborhood and they'll take one so that that other that's one of the benefits of a dropper is it it's not about in fact the last thing you want is catching two fish at once and yeah. it doesn't happen all that often but that other fly like a blob can really attract fish in and pull them in from a distance it normally wouldn't see a smaller fly you know because it, it blends in better with these surroundings so you know for those anglers that are just getting into fishing blob patterns it can be a little overwhelming but uh the colors that you want to think about for time the blobs, whatever material you use, I mean, uh, the shade, you know, biscuit, prawn, uh, watermelon um, are all good colors. You know, bright pink, you know, and uh, hot orange, 
and chartreuse green yeah. are, are, are all good colors. Uh, you know, sometimes one color is better than the other, but uh, you, you want a selection of, uh, of colors. Yeah, and I've, I've also um, got uh, fish have been catching them on blobs during the winter, which just further <laughs> illustrates your point of trout feeding on them. But another thing to try as well, and I've done, is, is fishing micro leeches tied in blob colors. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so short, you know, small ones, and again, you're playing that color card to suggest a cluster, or even just they're teed in on that color, and it, it works. Right? It's, so. They're they're just another tool in the toolbox, tool yeah. box, and uh, I guess that's yeah, why my toolbox is so big. Yeah, <laughs> so that's why I've got. Typically, I take I've used those. We both use those MFC boat boxes, and I have almost one entirely full of bobs, <laughs> doobies, fabs. Apps, worms, and my beadhead version I call the shower spider. I've become quite a, a, an attractor addict. So um, yeah. but it's, it, once you, they are fun. They are fun to fish, and they, they can certainly save a day. Um, so what are you going to obviously be fishing, Brian, um, you know, slowly in these conditions um, for the most part? So floating lines, indicators, or hovers, maybe clear intermediates, because it's all shallow and fishing slow, isn't it? Yeah, and then, you know, uh, if we want a fast strip weighted flies right off the bottom of the like and like a type three a type three yeah type one three or a type three it's, it's a good line to have as well yeah. uh, but again uh, most of our fishing is gonna be is going to be in shallow water so those floating lines uh, midge tip merger tip lines uh in the or, or floating lines naked floating lines with uh indicator setups you know those are going to be your your, your standard go-to um, lines and pretty slow retrieves um you know that's the beauty of the indicator it, it suspends the fly which allows you to target a certain depth but also really helps you get a good retrieve in because you don't have the risk of the fly hanging up you can just let it sit and let mother nature drift it around for you so yeah yeah um, there's some questions coming here, Brian. Let's pop one in just to break it up a little bit. Does the variety of strains uh, in the camel region all behave similar after ice, or do you find differences in their behavior? You know, um, I would say that uh, so the, the three major strains that we find in lakes around the Kamloops Merritt area are, are obviously the Panask Rainbow, uh, the Blackwaters, a rainbow strain and then the Fraser Valley. So yeah. the, the, the Panask and Fraser Valley uh, behave uh, fairly similar. They'll both be in shallow water uh, looking and feeding and obviously the Fraser Valleys are the most aggressive feeders. But black waters are, they tend to roam around a lot more and they'll go into deeper water. Uh, so they, they, they don't quite act the same way as Panask. Panask are literal zone feeders, shallow water shoal feeders 99% of the time. Same right. as Fraser Valley because the Fraser Valley is nowhere the grocery store is. But black waters are they get so <laughs> they get so big and fat they can't move yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you have a better chance of catching a black water strain on the edges of the drop off, even right right at ice off. They 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 tend to like that little bit deeper water. Okay. All right. Um, just some other questions we can bring in. Oh, you're talking about blobs. Bring this one back. And what material you use for the watermelon blob? That's an actual color, isn't it? Watermelon. Yeah. So, I, you know, my one of my favorite blob materials is um, slush jelly. So it's an FNF product, UK product. It's called slush jelly. Uh, but you and it, they have a watermelon um, uh, color. But you can also get uh, watermelon in uh, in in uh, ecstatic semperfly. Yeah, that, that is a uh, cool uh, material, that, isn't it? A new ecstatic material that they've got that you know that soft watermelon pink color, yeah. and then you can get it in in trans like T15 uh, fly box T15 or uh, and there's other brands that make yeah. that traditional uh, sh translucent chenilles. To get that watermelon fear but my personal preference for blobs is a, i like to use softer materials yeah. because that way they'll mouth it and they, they'll chew on it before for quite a while before they feel the barb whereas yeah. sometimes if it's a 
harder material. They'll, they don't like the feel of it around. They'll spit it out. And we know this because we watched them on cameras eating blobs. Yeah. And, you know, they'll suck it in, chew it around, spit it out before, and you won't even know they're there. Yeah, but you got to be careful sometimes because they will sometimes, if, if there's any slack in it, they'll suck it in a little too deep. So I always, because sometimes you'll see on the indicator, it looks like a, it's just bouncing around as though some small panfish was playing with it. And a lot of times you should hit it as soon as it starts to quiver and move like that yeah. for risk of them not sucking it right down. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Let me get that. Let me get that question out of here now. Um, so, okay, let's move on. I know there's lots of questions. We're going to get to them. I'm trying to bring them in as I can and we'll, we'll catch them all in. The end. I know there's lots of questions about, uh, I'm seeing the questions on fish hatcheries and stocking and droughts and all that. We're going to, we're going to get all of that in there to you. So, um, so yeah, anything else, Brian, tactics wise, we're, we're going to do, we're, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just really important to go onto the water with, a you know, a full suite of fly lines ready to fish because you just mm -hmm. don't what you just don't know what what you're going to encounter. Uh, because remember, it's typically a non-hatch situation, so you just don't know what to expect. Um, and so you, you need you need a bunch of rods and reels all set up. That's the bottom. Line. Yeah, I've typically got two or three. I'd be out there like you with a the strike indicator set up, perhaps midge tip, emerger tip. A hover and usually I've got two or three ready to go because we're if we're path of least resistance creatures so if we have to struggle to put take lines off and put them on we tend not to do them at times and that we miss out on some great fishing right or you're, nothing worse than finding out at the end of the day you would you know you started with you know type a line a and stuck yeah. with it and then you come and tell me man I killed him on the strike indicator and I was just too lazy to change over right so so you miss yeah. out. So, um, yeah, some some good stuff there. Yeah. Now, now, after after the lakes turned, we're still in early yeah. tactics. What what what's going to change? We're going to start to see some of those uh, those uh, hatches start to get going once that temperature gets above about fifty Fahrenheit, right? That's sort of the magic temperature. Yeah, I mean, once certainly once temperatures get over ten degrees Celsius or fifty Fahrenheit, then we know we're in the we're in the midst of some major hatches, but they'll they'll start quite a bit earlier than that in 45, 46, you start mm -hmm. seeing them. And so now we're talking about focused feeding by the fish, be it chronomids or mayflies, and then further down the line, damsels, caddis, dragons. But but in the spring months, right after ice off, the first emergences are always chronomids. And typically they're smaller pupa that come off although every year is different sometimes you'll see a bigger one first so but at normal the normal uh transition for is from smaller to bigger as the season progresses but yeah no you don't want to be prepared to to be fishing chronomids typically in in shallower water because that water is warming up now you know that mud bottom on those north facing slopes on those lakes is uh, you know they're gonna heat up quicker and, uh, it's gonna stimulate the the, the larva to, to uh, mature and then pupate and then you're gonna have your first chronomid hatches you know and then they're always occurring over that the muddiest black mud bottom yeah, yeah. portion well they love they, they love that stuff so question uh, about colors and what chronomids are best to have after ice off Black and red. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you, you don't want to. You always want to have some black and reds, right? Yeah. Black sallies. Yeah. Uh, and and then like uh, uh, zucchinis are always a, a go to. Uh, I tend to fish at ice off with white beads because typically the water early in the spring isn't crystal clear yet, so that you know a white bead helps to to get the attention of those fish that are cruising by. Uh, and you you could you could have you should always have chromies or something with uh, you know bright silver static bag or window tent mm -hmm. round. Um, but basically if you have your typical fly box with you, you know you and I always say, you know, if we only had, you know, 
one fly to use, it'd be a, you know, be a, a, a black and red and, and then followed by, you know, you know, and something bright like a chromey. <laughs> yeah. And we've been playing around with other, you know, attractor chronomids have become more important in recent years where we're fishing, you know, flies, you know, thanks to people like John Kent with some of his creations, you know, using the, you know, those bright mylars and uh, for ribbing white beads, uh, you know, just they stick out in the crowd, but we're also going the other way too. You, you know, we started last, you know, last year more earnest using those really dull pupa, right. That are, you know, very somber colors and, and, and not real flashy. And, and, yeah, and, no, I yeah. think, well, I think one, one tip we could give, uh, uh, our audience is, you know, don't be afraid to fish dull patterns. Yeah. Not flashy, shiny ones that, you know, thread body, thread rib, dull patterns that, that, are, that are pupa that have emerged, but are suspended at the bottom and are not gassed up. So they're not yeah. foamied up. And uh, we, it's an, I, I'm seeing more and more uh, fish feeding on non gassed up pupa. And for some yeah. reason, the pupa are not gassing up right away. Yeah. And it's over the past few years, we've, uh, you know, my, my group of friends, we, we've been fishing more and more double pupa. Yeah. I've, I've got, I remember one, one year in Manitoba, I, I got a tiger trout I took about a foot off the bottom, and that was a real eye opening experience because did the throat sample, and those pupa were, all, were maroon, very dull, weren't moving very much. And as I'm watching them in the dish, I'm watching that sort of maroon colored hemoglobin leave their bodies and they start turning olive on me. And they're still dull, right? So, and then eventually, you know, I left them in there long enough. A few started to get a little gassed up. There wasn't too much oxygen left, I don't think, in that um, little vial. But really fascinating to watch how they, you know, we always think that they're this one color and that they're tough enough as it is and now you see them doing this three color change within one species depending on what stage um they are in in that pupil state so that's that's why we need box number two right we got all the blobs in one <laughs> and then we need another one for the you know it's going to be a file cabinet with all these flies in them it's just horrible so it's endless uh, yeah so, <laughs> So there's some questions here. We can take a little pause here. Um, you know, good friend Steve Dotto here. Brian, do you remember as serious a drought in BC in the past? You know, we, we, we've had we've had dry years uh, we, in the late '70s to the early '80s, and then and then we got wet for quite a number of years, and the water table really rose, but. Uh, what's going on in, BC, in the interior regions of BC now is is serious, and uh, yeah. we haven't we haven't seen it water levels like this as low as they are. Especially the you know, I'm just shocked at what the South Thompson drainage is, you know, how low the rivers are and and the big lakes. So you know and they, these are all filled by you know snow melt and river systems and not a lot of snow. Not yeah. a lot of snow. No, like I said in the opening, we're facing the same thing uh, where I am in Alberta. They're already seriously worried about forest fires um, because we have, you know, to the east side of the province, so much grass. They're like potato chips, and it, all it takes is one errant cigarette or a, you know, early season lightning strike or some, some, some kind of a, some kind of fire starter, and it, it's going to go. Right, and our lake, I'm worried about our lakes and uh, as well, and it's it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, okay, uh, there's a question about oh, you, we were talking about shallow water and deep. I remember Brian, you you sent me some video last year. I think you were on Six Mile where you still had ice around the edge of the lake, and there was a little opening about three feet wide all the way around the margins, and there was chronomids coming off. Uh, uh -huh. Right, right there. So uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. You, you know, you bring all your flies. You, know, you yeah. just never know. Uh, deep lining in the spring. There is sometimes. There are a few lakes that have a surprising deep water emergence, which you wouldn't really expect. You know, the the only lake that I know that has deep lining opportunities right 
cut ice off is White Lake, you know, towards Salmon Arm. You know, within days of the lake coming off, of the ice coming off, you can dangle in 45 to 55, 60 feet of water, and they're on chronomids. Swallows are even out, but that's, I do not, I cannot think of another lake that has that deep water emergencies right at ice off. There yeah, because, could be others, I just, I don't know of them. Yeah, no, I haven't, you know, ours are the same. Um, even, when, you know, when I'm down in the States, you know, this week, on Pyramid, we'll be fishing coronamids too, and it'll, 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 we expect it to be like last year at this time, a, a pretty shallow game, uh, yeah. which is good because we're fishing from shore anyway because that lake's big and can get a little nasty at times. So, um, so just some other questions going on about uh, um, stocking here as well, Brian, pulling on your uh, your past a little bit. Uh, how's the stacking pro, you know, keeping in touch with your colleagues at the society? Um, how, how, how's the stocking program looking this day? Have they made any adjustments after the impact of last year's winter kill? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the ministry fishery staff have, have been able to, uh, uh, in, increase, uh, stockings on, on lakes that, uh, that did winter kill or had severe, you know, weren't total kills, but were significant because we had the advantage of, uh, uh, putting fall fry into lakes and uh, uh, you know we of course if in the perfect world we, we would have an endless supply of catchable Fraser valleys to jump start on yeah. winter kill fishery but there's a finite number of them and they're there because they take so much room to to house and hatchery since we don't have the capacity uh, and uh, a large percentage of these, Trace Valley catchables go to the urban stocking programs in the lower mainland, southern Vancouver Island. But the hardest hit lakes like like Roche in, in Region 3 and Forest in Region 5, we're able to get some catchable Trace Valleys in there to really give those lakes a jump start. Cause, so they were put in those very productive lakes and last spring, and they just grew like crazy all yeah. summer and fall. So, you know, fingers crossed, those lakes that had partial or complete kills uh, last winter make it this winter because uh, they'll be well on their way to uh, uh, providing some great uh, fishing. Yeah, I'm sure with, if they're killed and that insect population, invertebrate population didn't suffer as much, those, uh, Bugs and other invertebrates have some free time to swim around carelessly and not worry about getting chomped. <laughs> and then they put in those Fraser Valleys and others and they just <laughs> graze the heck out of them. So good question here about how fast do, do uh, you know, stock fish and just fish in general, rainbows and brookies grow after a winter in a winter kill. So in the, in, in the Thompson, Nicola and the Caribou regions, Okanagan regions, East Kootenai regions, it, very nutrient rich water. So a catchable size uh, Fraser Valley, which is, you know, seven to eight and a half, nine inches in length, stocked in May, can easily be over three pounds by fall. Uh, Panas don't grow quite as fast as Fraser Valley's, but Panas stocked in, in May into a lake that winter killed the previous winter by October will in a productive lake and the interior will be you know 12 to 14 inches in length and yeah. and decent girth but it's the following spring make it this winter and now they're they're two plus two years and a bit old that's when they'll really start to shine yeah 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 because and it's also a function of you know how much food the biomass they've got to eat right so yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Um, just going to see if there's any more of that, and then we can uh, just coming through. Oh, the question about kokanees. Sorry, I know you like those from your your forays on winter in on the ice and, and playing with your new. You, you should tell everybody about your new toy you bought this winter. Yeah, you know they're so the. About the, the provincial fisheries program and the freshwater society are always uh, communicating and and uh, 
looking at different lakes and creating new fisheries. And certainly, I mean, there's a lot of interest uh, in more cocaine lakes, but, you know, deciding on a lake uh, to, to put cocaine in, um, you, you've you got to have the groceries there. You, you, you've got to, uh, you got to have the zooplankton populations. You've got to have the, the, the deep water zones for them to survive in the summer months. Uh, and then, uh, then you have to consider if you've already got a trout fishery in there that you don't overstock it so that you impact the uh, overlapping uh, with the with the rainbow that are in the lake. So it's a it's a process that uh, takes a bit of thought because it you know adding coconut to a lake really changes the whole ecology of the lake, and uh, it, it's the lake the candidate lake has to have tick off the right boxes mm -hmm. um, uh, before before we can do it. And then, you know, we need, we got to make sure the lake, if it's a lake that we want to put coking in, that it's got an adequate access so that when the hordes arrive, you know, they've, they've got somewhere to camp. The hordes are the boats. You know, it's, it's, so there's social issues that you, yeah. have to, uh, you have to consider. But yeah, the bottom line is the, both the ministry, the fisheries, provincial fisheries, Managers and the First Rock Society are looking at more lakes in the southern interior and the Caribou regions for uh, introducing kokanee. Okay. Question here, too, because the recent um, starting to bring in the horsefly strain and what's been, I know it's probably still early days, but maybe talk on some of the reasons why. And, yeah, and what... I haven't had a chance to get up to the Caribou to fish for horseflies, but Everybody that tells me about them, they're just very impressed with them, and it makes sense. They're, a, you know, they originate from the Horsefly River, uh, and uh, which they spend their, you know, they, their lives in uh, Quinell Lake. Mm -hmm. So they're deep ocean type rainbows, big tails, aggressive feeders. They got teeth. They like eating kokanee, um, and they do really well in small lakes. Plus. There are late maturing stock, meaning they don't sexually mature until they're five, six, or seven years of age, which allows them, if they're diploid, to really grow big uh, before they decide to mature. But by all accounts, uh, on the lakes that they're in, they pull hard, and uh, they're good-looking fish. So I, I'm hoping we'll see a few, few lakes in the Thompson Nicola region with. Uh, some kokanee in, uh, with some horsefly in them as well. But yeah, definitely uh, a trip to the caribou uh, targeting horsefly lakes is, uh, is yeah. on my bucket list. Yeah, well, both of you have had, you and I have had the good fortune to catch them on Quinell Lake in their home waters, and they were impressive fish there, and they got yeah. very big. Uh, and a question I know you've talked to me about this and in and, and the schools we've done and, and clinics and things about the impact of forest fires and you know, reduction of, of shoreline growth and, and, and what impact it's had on, on lakes in general. And it's been, it's been serious and negative, hasn't it? You know, we're, we're, um, I know the ministry is, at least in the Thompson Nicola region, has, has, uh, has, an, has expanded their ongoing uh, water chemistry sampling throughout the season, throughout the year on a large number of lakes because of the chemistry that is changing in those lakes as a result of timber harvesting compounded by bug kill, compounded by forest fires, and then add low snowpacks. And uh, the water chemistry is no question is changing. And I give the example here that mentioned was Tonkwa. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's going to be many, many years before we see Tonkwa like it was in the 80s and 90s. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, uh, you know, we, we, the, the, the watershed has changed yep. significantly, and it's going to take a long time to get proper green up in there. Um, you had the fires and things like that. So, but the, you know, the the bottom line is the ministry is aware that these, these things are happening on a large scale. 
uh, in, at a landscape level, but also they're looking closely at individual lakes that never winter killed in the past and are now having at least partial kills and, and the odd lake that's never winter killed having complete kills. So uh, it, there's a lot of factors involved in it and certainly it's 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 how uh, healthy the watershed is in terms of green plant life you know and then you look at the amount of forest harvesting that has occurred it's uh and then you had a fire and then yeah. it, well you and i both seen it with roche lake right years ago that lake was clear beautiful sight fish beautiful marl and kara shoals and it's changed it's, not, it's totally we'll changed that again no 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 well, there's a question here. I have to put this one up, Brian, just because you and I were talking prior to. So, Robbie, <laughs> Brian, this is the new toy Brian's got. Yeah, I know. So, uh, he's convincing me about uh, live imaging sonar, like the uh, Hummingbird Mega Live, uh, which I uh, got this winter and I've been playing with it fairly regularly with Kokanee. And it's it's live imaging, and it's a game changer. It's, uh, it's you see what you see is live, so you know these sounders have got down imaging, forward facing imaging, and landscape imaging, and so it's uh, it's a toy, but it's 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 a toy that will allow you to learn so much about fish behavior and movement patterns. You still got to figure out how to catch them. Yeah, I, I think some people think some of this stuff, and while it certainly helps, it's it's a tool, and you've got to learn how to use it, and and know when to use it, and how to interpret what it's telling you. It just doesn't make, you know, fish swim to the boat and sit <laughs> underneath and wait to be picked off one by one. There's a little bit more to it than that. So, Absolutely. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'll be I think I'll be joining you in that uh, soon. So. Um, oh, and the question about because we're going to have a, we're going to talk about chronomids a little bit more as we finish out our uh, presentation tonight. But what's the biggest midge adults you've seen? Well, we we get those bombers, don't we, in the summer months? Oh well, I, you and I, Phil, have seen uh, what we call bomber midges, where where the pupa are almost well, they're over three quarters of an inch in length. Um, yeah. So the adults are are close to they're not quite as big but they're close to three quarters of an inch in length, uh, and uh, and that not not in, and not in just one lake in in lots of lakes so that they're 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 big I mean they're bigger than anything you'd see in any of the western states uh, I'm, I'm sure you well you spend time yeah. down there. You, you know, you yeah, see generally it, it seems to be you know lower uh, lower latitude, um, and I think one of the reasons maybe, especially with lakes that don't freeze over, those hatch cycles just keep going and going and going, so they that species in there doesn't get the long growth period in the larval stage like we see in a lot of our lakes that gets that gets ice on they just can't hatch. So species have evolved to um, you know, live longer life cycles in those conditions and they spend longer in that larval stage and they eat and they get bigger. So, um, yeah, no, some good questions here. Uh, oh, we'll take a side. We'll come back to Cromans in a second. Oh. Any, any favorite shiner patterns? That's, that's yours, Phil. Because <laughs> you fish them. <laughs> yeah, we, I, you know, there's some fun patterns. Um, you know, my first book, I had a shiner pattern. I've always been a fan of the the zonker type flies, you know, with the micro pine squirrel and the micro mink, um, they swim so well. Like little clousers, marabou based minnows. Um, there's an English pattern I've been playing with too. It'll be in my next uh, BCL Doors column I'm working on called the snake. Um, that's uh, a pretty neat looking impression. And most of the times when those fish get on that uh, uh, bait fish, they get a little crazy. And as long as it, you know, I, I had some really good fun. This past fall in Manitoba, fishing suspender uh, minkies or popper fries, where you literally take a booby foam and tie it, sticking off the front of the fly like a big, and you this makes the fly ride just underneath the surface, and you strip it, and it's it's the takes are either this big wall of water coming up behind the fly, or like a white shark taking a seal, just this explosion. It's it's pretty scary. There's tons of good 
so many good bait fish patterns out nowadays, you know, for freshwater and for salt that can easily be adapted to the size and color. Uh, good friend uh, Cheech from Fly Fish Food, he's got his baby fat minnow, another favorite one of mine, just tie it in shiner colors. And, and uh, that's, a, that's a good fly, that baby fat minnow. I do like that. Um, tactics for lakes that don't freeze, Brian. So, you know, I remember on the coast, our lakes didn't freeze when I lived there. And I know down the, you know, Oregon, Washington as well. A lot of those uh, lower elevation lakes never seem to freeze and they don't get stratified. Like, like, like we talked about in the beginning with the, the impact of the ice and thermal stratification. Yeah. You know, those lakes, those coastal lakes are, or lakes that don't freeze, you know, you have to think that, that the zooplankton population is always readily available for fish to feed on. And I would think you could do quite well with blobs. Yeah. Yeah, we used to fish deeper. And I know in England, their lakes don't ice over and they tend to fish their winter fisheries. The fish move off into the deep water like they do in ours and they stay there. And then as the, the shallows warm and the insect growth go, and then they migrate back into feed, but they don't get stuck into the shallows um, like we experience with our lakes that, that get ice on. So, um, yeah. Well, um, you know, we've had lots of questions about coronamids like this one. Uh, what's more important, size versus color? Um, maybe we should tell them that we've got a, a, an upcoming uh, online school again. Um, where last year, we, Brian and I ran for the first time uh, online conquering coronamids masterclass that, uh, you know, we're, we're, thankfully was quite well received. And uh, we've had lots of demand to do it again. So we are. Um, it's, it starts in March. Um, it's our Conquering Chronomids Masterclass, 11 live sessions. So it's sessions like this. We do it through Zoom. Um, Brian and I are doing our uh, seminars and, and tying flies on camera and all that stuff and interacting live with anybody, everybody. The sessions are about an hour and a half minimum. And we go through everything from life cycle, equipment, strike indicator presentations, the naked techniques, sinking line presentation, um, leader setups, including dropper setups I like to use for those of us that can fish multiple flies. Um, we've got, you know, the fly tying sessions. We provide the pattern recipes, all of that stuff. So, you know, at, at the risk of same, shameless self-promotion, hey, Brian, um, if, if, you know, you and I both love fishing for it so much and, and really enjoy when others fall in love with it too. So uh, um, certainly something um, people can take advantage of. Um, so to sign up, I see a question already from Andrew. Thank you. Um, if you go to mine and Brian's online Stillwater fly fishing store, which is stillwatersflyfishingstore.com, uh, we'll get that running back there. You go to the online learning section. Um, you'll see it listed there along with the course I'm doing with Rick Haefeli as well. If you want to up your game in regards to aquatic entomology, both rivers and lakes. Um, we provide all of that stuff. We even give a discount code for our uh, online store as well. Um, it starts on March 18th, 2024. Um, that's a Monday, I believe. We're doing it Mondays and Wednesdays until the 11 sessions are done in early April. Um, and again, they're all recorded. So if you can't make it, um, don't worry. You get access, lifetime access to the recording. So you can watch it over and over and over again. So if anybody is interested in that, um, I'll also have that in the comments section as well, and you'll see some other uh, advertising. And if you're on my mailing list, you're going to get information about this as well. So, uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to add anything else uh, to that. Um, yeah, no, it's it's your if you want to want to improve your uh, chronomet fishing skills, um, it's it's as detailed as you're ever going to get, and yeah. it, it, it will. Well, you will become a better still water crawler with that. And, you know, so the question that Jerry had just asked of, you know, what's more important, color or size, you know, that was, that's the type of stuff we, we talk about in yeah. it. And, you know, it's, you know, one, what do you do? It's a balancing act, but uh, certainly you want to have the fly the, the right size. But uh, but then you, you need a throat pump sample to, yeah. to find color. Yeah, so it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Stuart from Scotland, absolutely. We had uh, uh, people on our last class from all over North America, and I think we might have even had some from Australia and New Zealand. I think so. Um, they all start at uh, the classes start at 
7 p.m. Pacific on those nights. Uh, so, Stuart, you're about seven hours ahead, just about two in the morning. So, uh, but you will have access to those recordings. So, um, if you if you want to get up early, I know I'm getting up early a lot these days to watch Premier League soccer. So, <laughs> yeah, the other way around. So, um, but uh, yeah, and I guess we'll uh, finish up. With, I just saw one last question, and it's interesting about uh, um, two questions here about fertilization that's going on in some of the coastal lakes. So. No, I, I think, well, to, the, probably the, you're going to get the answer by contacting the provincial fisheries uh, program um, it, for the, low, for the uh, lower mainland region. So uh, you, can, you can get that information uh, by looking or going online to the provincial government website and Ministry of Forest Lands and uh, it's natural resource management now uh and you yeah. can you can find out the regional office and they'll have a dedicated small lakes biologist in that region that should be able to answer your questions and and steve has corrected me it's eight hours ahead he's right i'm in the pacific time zone right now it's eight hours i'm used to <laughs> yeah. where i am in the mountain time zone it's always seven so whatever time zone you're in so anyway i hope oh okay one last question uh how do you tell if a lake is turning over because we did touch that on that in the beginning I think yeah. we've managed to get every question, but uh, yeah, how do you tell? So the, the telltale for a, a lake in, that you've arrived at a lake in turnovers is the water is going to be turbid. It's going to okay. be murky. There's going to be debris suspended floating around on the surface as well as uh, below the surface in the water column. You'll often see dead snail shells floating around, uh, but the lake is not going to be clear and there's going to be lots of junk in the water. And so you might have had great fishing the week before and go back and then have uh, encountered that dirty water. And that's the lake and turnover. You're going to need that lake's going to need four or five, six days, depending on how the winds, are, whether they're sustained or not, to clear up. And then they'll clear up and then they'll stay clear uh, for the rest of the season. And the only other difference will be if that lake develops uh, algal blooms in the summertime but the water will be clearer yeah okay well everyone i hope you enjoyed that i really want to thank you brian for joining me once again always good to see you until i actually physically see you <laughs> and we get to spend some time on the water together we went through a lot tonight we talked about um lake chemistry and, and biology and, and how lakes function coming out of the winter period and, and really critical to understand how lakes work because it just put you in the right place 90% of the time um, because where you'll fish in early spring, you will not be fishing there in, in the warmer months because uh, often the fish won't be there. Um, I think we've managed to cover every question. If I haven't, I'll scan through them and, you know, uh, type and respond and answer or uh, get Brian to help me with one. Um, so, you know, as the lakes come off, get out on the water. If you can't, um, obviously watch this again if you want and uh, consider – uh, signing up for mine and Brian's uh, online coronamid course. If you're struggling with coronamids, I know we can help you um, get over that and, and scratch that itch for you once and for all. Um, I hope you found it helpful. Um, and again, this will be recorded. Um, so uh, go to my YouTube channel or my uh, Phil Rooley Fly Fishing Facebook page. It will be there as well. And we'll try and share it around to a few others. Brian can share it on his Facebook page too. And uh, look, we're looking, look forward to seeing you on, on future events, not only lake talks like yeah. this, but uh, tying nights. Maybe Brian will get you on up yeah. one night and we'll tie some chronomets. <laughs> we're we're going to be on the water before we know it. I'm going to yeah. get busy. Well, I'm going on, I'm going on the water tomorrow. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great night. And uh, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. You bet.